Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to As I Live and Grieve. We're here again with another guest that we know you are going to enjoy listening to. Today's guest is Michelle Benio. Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Hi, Kathy. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're delighted too. Michelle's specialty, well, I'm just going to let Michelle tell you. Michelle, would you tell our <laughs> listeners a little bit about yourself, please? Yes. Um, I am uh, an early childhood parent coach and a, a certified grief specialist. And I came by this uh, partly by career choice and partly by necessity. I was already an early childhood educator when I had my own two young children and my son at the age of four, when my daughter was 15 months, was diagnosed with cancer. And it plunged me into an area of early childhood education and development that that I didn't know anything about, hadn't mm -hmm. gotten any of that in getting my master's. And we went through his cancer journey for two and a half years. And then he died. And my daughter was three and a half. And she said to me, Mommy, half of me is gone. And so mm -hmm. I... Of course, I already knew that I needed to care for her um, through her grief, but she, from the very beginning, was such a, a case study for me because from the beginning of our journey with cancer, which was, um, you know, a different kind of grief all on its own, we lost their innocent childhood at that point. Sure. She really was in this with us from the very beginning, and that was really evident in the way that she responded to things happening in the family. Mm -hmm. So when she said half of me is gone, and I looked at her lifetime ahead of her, yeah. and knew that she had no other siblings, I thought, okay, she can't grow up half gone. <laughs> you know, I right. need to help her be whole and happy. And I should say this was 21 years ago, she's now 25. And I thought, okay, I'm in the the area of early childhood. I will go find the resources that are out there. And there really weren't any out there. And there aren't a whole lot more now. There have been a few more books written, but there really are not a whole lot of supports out there. And so I, I knew at the time that someday I was going to have to provide something to families that wasn't there for me. And I have now founded Good Grief Parenting, and it is, it's a parenting focus to help parents who have this young child who has this devastating loss in those formative, formative early childhood years when our identity is being formed and, you know, our brain is developing um, in just amazing ways based on every experience we have. And I've just learned the significance of sibling loss at any age, but especially in this young age. Right. And I've learned what what children need to grow up whole and ha happy after the experience that most of them don't articulate the way my daughter did. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure, you know, many of them do feel that uh, tearing away of identity when they have a close sibling who dies. And it doesn't even have to be my my children were very close. She spent much time with him when he was in the hospital. We just knew that we didn't want to keep her separate from the rest of the family when we were going through this. And that turned out to really be a really good decision rather than protecting her from right. cancer yeah. and, you know, bald kids with, with ports in their chests and, you know, right. all the things that we really don't want children. I didn't want my son to experience it either, but we had it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. she, um, she and her brother got to be very close only because we did include her in all right. of his life for the years they were together. So 
that's my story. That's what's brought me here. Yeah. Well, it, I can only imagine um, it's devastating enough to be going through grief yourself. Mm-hmm. It's horrifying to lose a child. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost an infant son, but mm-hmm. this was right after birth within 24 hours. Um, but to have been able to know your child and watch your child grow and then suffer is awful. And then it it's like a triple whammy mm-hmm. because you have your child going through cancer. You have a younger child watching her sibling mm-hmm. go through this and even yourself. And then to deal with the death, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't even imagine. Um, mm-hmm. right. Your daughter, her, what she said to you is so touching. Mm-hmm. At such and a young age. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that your decision to involve her in the day to day routine of cancer and speak the truth mm-hmm. and let her know all that probably did indeed lead to a closer relationship. Yes. With her brother yes. as well. And it's one of those things that as a parent, it's almost a uh, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Right. And you don't know which decision is Mm -hmm. best for you. Mm -hmm. Why, why do you think, or what advantage from your decision, what advantages do you feel there were in helping your daughter deal with the loss of her sibling? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just tell you why we made that decision. The very first night that her brother had to go to the hospital overnight, his dad went with him And I was home with her and she was 15 months old and she started wandering around the house upstairs and downstairs to the garage door to her brother's bed. She was just wailing. She was making an inhuman sound. I've never heard a human being sound that way, let alone my little 15 month old. And when I went to her to try to comfort her, she'd push me away and throw herself on the floor. So I knew from that very first night that she was experiencing what we were. And there was no way I was going to have her not be in the know. Because for kids, as adults, we often want to protect our kids. But the truth is, they they feel it. They know something's going Mm -hmm. on. I wasn't a mess that night. I wasn't in hysterics. I wasn't being you know, really, uh, she wasn't picking that up from me in the moment. She picked that up from what was happening in our family and the fact that her brother and her dad were gone. And she didn't understand why. No, but she could feel that it was something horrible. And so any doubt that we have, um, and again, me being in the field of early childhood already, I knew that some of the ideas that we have about young children not grieving uh, were wrong. I mean, it really wasn't until the 1960s to 80s that we started to really um, recognize that young children do grieve and that they Mm -hmm. do experience loss. And so, but she just didn't leave any question in my mind. Mm -hmm. And, And so by being with her brother, she was able to, it, it normalized what we were going through, which was important because it was our life. Right. And, you know, it needed, she could have the best possible childhood only because um, she got to spend time with her brother in the hospital. It, he was in a children's hospital, so they were well equipped for little siblings as well. Right. You know, that was her twos and threes not, um, you know, not going to a bunch of playgrounds where right, he couldn't right. go with that with his immunity and co- compromise, right. but doing other things. Mm-hmm. And she handled it. She handled it well. She wasn't surprised by the outcome because she saw it progressing. And we were honest with him and with her. One time he, before his seventh birthday, when he was getting sicker and we had done everything we could for him, he asked us, he said, do you think I'm going to live till my seventh birthday? 
And we said to him, no, honey, we don't think you will, because we knew we didn't think he would. He um, had had every treatment imaginable, and his cancer had come back a second time, uh, a third had come back a second time. So he had like three rounds of right. it, and mm-hmm. there was nothing more to be done. And so we were honest. And so his sister knew that, I mean, she was three and a half. Did she fully understand death? No, but she did understand it more than a lot of kids her age, simply because we talked about it, um, because we had to. So over the years, I've seen that and what many what many parents will report, you know, about kids who have had exposure at this young age to either the kids who have had the illness themselves or the siblings is that they they are wiser in many ways. They're kind of, you know, uh, mature for their age. She certainly was. She experienced things that her peers could not ever identify with. Right, right. right. And it enabled her to grow into, you know, um, her later years being more empathetic about kids that had hardships and just, you know, in many ways, she really uh, gained some skills, compassion, empathy, those kinds of things from her experience. Sure. How did you decide as far as uh, explaining things to her and telling her the truth, telling her what was going on? How did you decide what terminology to use? And how, I guess, how medical, how technical Mm -hmm. did you get with Mm -hmm. this three to four year old? You know, that is a, that's one of the most important things that I, that I want parents to, to recognize because it is not our first thought. And that is when, uh, I mean, when we were talking about him dying and when, and when he in fact did die to use the words, death and died to talk about the fact that he can die as being um, his body stops working. He can't do any of the things he used to do. Mm -hmm. We chose when he died. um, And then, you know, he's buried and she sees his grave and, you know, understands kind of what that is. We talked about that because we have a Christian Christian orientation, a Christian faith. Our right. belief is that, you know, his spirit was still with us and that was bar- what was buried was his shell and he didn't mm-hmm. need that body anymore. But the thing that we can say as parents, whatever our, you know, uh, religious orientation is, is to use the words dead and died to not soften it for kids because kids don't have any attachment to that word. It doesn't mean to them what it means to us. It's just another vocabulary word that they're getting exposed to and learning. And it means that the body stops working. Mm -hmm. Uh, It happens when someone is either very, very sick or very, very old, you know, or sometimes an accident happens. And we don't need to give children any more than just that basic information. If they ask other questions, just answer what they ask. The thing about kids that's important to recognize is that, you know, what she understood at three and a half was pretty minimal. Even though she knew she wasn't going to see David anymore, she uh, would talk about sending a backpack of toys to the clouds so he could play with them or, you know, um, and I knew that she wasn't, she, she did understand, which many three and a half year olds wouldn't, she did understand she wasn't going to see him again. Well, as she got older, you know, he died when he was in kindergarten. And when she went to kindergarten, she had a new understanding and she was really her kindergarten picture is heartbreaking because I got a call from school that day saying that she was having a hard day. She was getting her picture taken as a kindergartner and she knew that was the age her brother was when he died. And she had a really oh, hard time dear. with that. Oh. And so as and as she went through her developmental stages, she understood his death and what she as a sibling had lost in new ways as she got older. And so not all of the questions come in the beginning. 
right. in the beginning, our kids just really need to understand that the body stopped working, that we're not going to see this person anymore, you know, and then of course they need assurances that when they get sick, it doesn't mean they're going to die. So that's right. why we kind of say people are very sick, but people don't always die when they're sick. And, you know, we try to, to teach them those words. But I always just say, simply be honest with your child when you ask about the terminology, Kathy. Dead and died are the words. That's right. what mm -hmm. happened. That right. Those are the only accurate words. Passed away isn't, even though as adults we know what that means, it is sure. an accurate terminology for what happened, and it can only yeah. get confusing for kids. So not knowing that you don't need to give them too much information, just what they need, and then let them ask for more. Right. Yeah. And and how about the, the funeral calling hours? Was she included in that as well? Yes. I would expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, that's that's a way for them to understand the finality of death, for them to, um, you know, get have an experience that gives them an understanding. It, it gives you a, and it's OK for kids to go to a funeral. It's right. also OK if they don't. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of adults feel that they shouldn't. And it really is OK for them to. You'll have to tell them what's going on. I know one thing I did that I'd recommend adults doing a little differently. We, of course, had an uh, an open casket and I had her, you know, I took her right over to her brother right. and I recommend that you, you know, that you kind of prepare kids and that you ask them, do you want to go see your brother? You know, that you ask them. Yeah. And sure. then if they, you know, touch him and he doesn't feel like he's supposed to feel, you know, you need to just be aware of what that experience will be like for sure. kids and be prepared to say he doesn't feel like, you know, like you want him to feel right. because he's died and his body's not working anymore. But it's not a bad thing. Just know that it will open up, you know, it'll open up future conversations that sure. you'll need to mm -hmm. be able to have honestly with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it can be very helpful as a way of providing some finality and some reality about, you know, what death is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. As your daughter grew, was there anything special that you did to keep her brother's memory alive for her? Many things. And, you know, this is another thing that I'm so glad you bring it up because one of the main reasons I do what I do is because as grievers, we get so much unsolicited input from people mm -hmm. who don't know what they're talking about. Right. We've talked and about it many times. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. For some reason, people just think that they can tell us what they think, and they haven't had our experience, but they're telling us how to go through it. Mm -hmm. And usually, they're not really on track. And I didn't know anything about grief. You know, I really did need to learn it all. I didn't mm -hmm. even know how my own grief was supposed to be. You know, when I was going through my grief, I everyone was telling me about the five stages of grief. And, and I didn't grieve that way. And I thought, what's wrong with me? But I have since really, part of what I've done over the last 20 years is learn everything that I can about grief and particularly sibling grief and loss and really found that there is a newer take, I think from about the 1990s, which is a little bit newer, on how we grieve and how not only okay it is to continue bonds with our loved one, but how healthy it is. Mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, luckily, because before, before that way of thinking came into the grief mm -hmm. uh, space, a lot of people subscribe to Freud's idea that grief was the the time that you get over, that you end the relationship yep. and you move on from it. Right. Right. And yep. that's what so many people still tell us, right? Mm -hmm. Get over it. Yep. yep. Yes. And when you, if you don't have, if you don't change, put the loved one's things away or change the bedroom or whatever, then they're, uh, they're concerned that you're not healthily grieving and that you're obsessing. Well, we now know that it really is healthy to carry the memory forward, and yes. especially for a bereaved sibling, 
and especially for my daughter, because she didn't have any living siblings. And when her brother died, she was still a sibling. And so, you know, the, the way that you can make that sort of make sense is to carry that relationship forward. And, you know, we talked about him being present with us and we, we just kept his presence. We kept his pictures, but you know, I have his Pokemon all these years later. I still have his Pokemon sweatshirt on the back of my chair in my sanctuary, which is where I spend time, where my daughter spends time. We still, um, every July 18th, we get a French silk pie wow. for his birthday mm-hmm. because he loved French silk pie. And in the end, when there was not a lot that he could eat, we let him have as much French silk sure, pie right? as he wanted. Sure. Yeah. And so these are really helpful for anyone trying to, to I use the term live forward because right. I want to emphasize that we're not just putting one foot in front of the other. The idea is that we're going to live life fully as we go forward without our loved one. And you know, I mean, Kathy, even though you didn't have years with your baby, you know how hard it was to have your life go forward and that baby wasn't with you. You had hopes and dreams. You expected that baby to come with you. Yeah. And so as a parent, we it's horrible to feel like you have to leave this person behind. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was glad, too, that I could have been exposed to a lot of ideas about grief that weren't helpful. But I really learned about the helpfulness of this early on. The other thing I'd say to anyone listening who is a griever, which is probably most of your listeners. Right. You instinctually know what's best for you. And I, and as grievers, we know we don't want to pack up our loved one and leave them behind. And so you need to be able to trust yourself that if you want to, my daughter, who's now 25 and happens to be living at home right now, is still in the bedroom that I decorated for my son. I've got rainbow stencils along the (laughs) ceiling up or the wall up by the ceiling. Um, You know, they were in that room together when he Mm. was four and she was 15 months. And that room has never changed because she didn't want it to. And even now she doesn't want it to. She'll move out and then I will, you know, redecorate that room. But that's been a source of comfort for her to have mm-hmm. things. Sure. Stay the, sure. So. I, yeah. I, one of my favorite quotes, and I, I never remember it verbatim, but it, it more or less just says that for as long as you continue to speak their name, they will never die. Right. You know, and I think that what you speak of and, and a lot of the things that we can do ourselves and memories and everything, mm-hmm. it's important to we who grieve mm-hmm. to honor that person mm-hmm. and honor their death and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think I have like maybe one more question as kids grow and we know how kids are, they grow from the why, 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 and then eventually they get this age where they just want to shut you out. Mm-hmm. They don't want to hear anything you have to say. Mm-hmm. And it's been a long time since Stephanie was that age. <laughs> but I'm going to target it right around the the maybe 9-year-old, the 13-year-old. Mm-hmm. 16 and above is a whole nother ball game. But, <laughs> but this 9 to 13-year-old yeah. where they're starting to come into their own ability to process things, make decisions and make choices. Mm -hmm. If, and I know your expertise is early childhood. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stretch your expertise a little bit Mm -hmm. here. Do you have any guidance for parents who may be dealing with this, what I consider a very difficult age Mm -hmm. group, Mm -hmm. if they should be going through a similar situation where there is a sibling that is dying or has died, Mm -hmm. how they might engage with that other child. Yes, I I really do. And it it, it extends from 
the what I consider to be the biggest mistake that parents make when a loved one dies and when a child dies, and that is that they don't want to burden the living child with it when they're little, like the age that I deal with. Parents don't want to expose their child to this, and so right. they don't want to talk to them. And even at, at my daughter's age, as I've already shared with you, you know, I needed to talk to her about what was going on. Right. And that was very helpful to her. And I say that childhood is the best time to learn about grief, that when we um, expose kids to it, when they have to be, mm -hmm. we are helping them, not hurting mm -hmm. them. And we, beyond being honest, we need to open the door for conversation. Mm -hmm. So I would say whatever age your child is, you said it, Kathy, we want to keep speaking the loved one's name. It It's painful uh, and it's painful for older kids. You know, they're going to be processing it differently. Sure. But what we want them to learn from us is that we're not going to forget this child that we're, and that it's okay right. for them to speak the name and that we are open to talking about it. Right. That can be really hard for parents, but your child, whatever age they are, mm -hmm. needs to know that this is something we can talk about. We can talk about our feelings mm -hmm. as a parent. Mm -hmm. Don't try to make your child, uh, you know, don't deny that you're hurting. Right. Your child needs to see that. It gives right. them permission to show that to you mm -hmm. and ask them, um, you know, is there anything you want to talk about? Or I really miss your brother when we're doing this. What What do you miss the most? Mm -hmm. And if the child doesn't want to talk, that's okay. Don't force them. But they're learning that you want to hear from them. Mm -hmm. And when they want to talk, they'll know it's okay because you haven't kept this conspiracy of silence in the house. Right. right. Wise words. Yes. And the, the other the other thing I would say is I talk to parents about what I call essential messages. And that is the living child needs to know that they are so precious. They are capable no matter how they feel through this because it's devastating for them. They will get through this. You will get through this. And I'm so sorry, so sad that your brother died, but I am so glad that you are here. You are so precious to me. And make sure that child gets those essential messages. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when we're talking about the child who's died and we're remembering them, and we always remember the best about them. Right. Sure. And for an adolescent and a teen, especially. You know, they can hear how great their sibling was, and that equates to them not being as great. Mm. So just really be aware of those essential messages and be sure that you are affirming your living child, how much you, how, how precious they are to you and the things that, you know, that you're proud of them for and, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So those would be my two things, yeah. conversations and essential messages. Yeah. Beautifully said, yeah. Michelle. Beautifully said. Thank you. Well, it'll come as no surprise to anyone who listens to us week after week that our time is running out. <laughs> Before we wrap up, though, Michelle, we want to give you a few moments without us leading you with questions and comments to speak directly to our listeners. Let them know how they can get in touch with you. Let okay. them know what services you offer. Um, that they might avail themselves of. Anything you want our listeners to know, this is your turn. Okay, awesome. Well, first of all, I just, I hope that all of you have heard what I've said about not being afraid about going through grief with your child, because that's the way your family is going to heal, not by protecting them, but just allowing them to be with you in it. And you have a lot of innate wisdom, so trust yourself before you trust all those people that give you unsolicited advice. And to get a hold of me, you can find me at my website, which is goodgriefparenting.com. That's goodgriefparenting.com. And I have a good grief guide that gives you some that you can download um, for free that gives you some good insights, particularly about how to have conversations that are helpful for your child. You can also reach me at um, Instagram at Good Grief Parenting, 
And I have a link tree link there that can get you in touch with a place where you can schedule a 15 minute conversation with me. I'm available for that. And uh, I know I'm giving you a lot of information right now. I just also happen to be heading into the next run of my course called See Your Way Forward After Child Loss, which is a six week course for parents who are um, raising early childhood age bereaved siblings after child loss. So many ways I'm here to support you and happy to just be available to you through a 15 minute, um, you know, no obligation, no cost phone call to answer questions that I may be able to support you in. So goodgriefparenting.com. Great. Thank you. Our listeners know that we will put your contact information in the episode notes for the podcast, as well as on our website. So they will be able to get in touch with you. And to our listeners out there, Michelle has offered you a free 15-minute phone conversation with her. Now, we've spoken with her for 30 minutes. She has said so many things that how could you not take advantage of this 15-minute conversation with her? And consider taking her course because I don't think you're going to find very many out there that are specifically targeted for this horribly tragic, devastating point in your life, in all honesty. So all that being said, it's time for us to go. We hope you will uh, tune in again next week. We hope you have enjoyed listening today and hope that something said today has helped you, comforted you, that you feel supported. Take care of yourselves, as we always say, and check in again next time as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.